بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ستكون المحاضرة باللغة الإنجليزية ولذلك لمن يرغب بالترجمة إلى العربية يوجد ضغط على علامة الترجمة في الأسفل Welcome everyone to a new event organized by the Asian Studies Unit at King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies My name is Mohamed Rumizan I'm a research fellow at King Faisal Center I will be uh, moderating today's event uh, our lecture for today will last from roughly um, 30 up to 45 minutes. I will encourage all of you along that to write your questions in the designated box in the Q&A um, down below, as we will have a Q&A session after the lecture ends. Uh, in today's event titled Contemporary Turkey and New Ottomanism, we seek to focus on the origins of a new Ottomanism and its incorporation into the self-identity of a present-day Turkey. We also aim to discuss how new Ottomanism shapes Turkey's uh, foreign policy toward the Middle East, the Balkans, as well as the Caucasus. Um, I'm honored uh, today to present our distinguished guest for today, Dr. Hakan Yavuz, who is a professor at um, a professor of political science at University of Utah. Uh, Dr. Yavuz has B, uh, BA in international relations from the University of Ankara in Turkey. Uh, then he received his MA from uh, the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, um, before receiving his PhD from the University of Wisconsin Medicine in 1998 in also political science. Uh, our guest speaker and scholar, Dr. Yafuz, has significant academic and research contributions as he authored uh, more than 40 articles, uh, several books and book chapters, and projects uh, related to the subject of Islam, secularism, transnationalism, Turkey, civil society and public spheres, uh, nationalism, uh, and also Kurdish questions. And our topic today, New Ottomanism and Modern Turkish Politics. Some of his um, articles have been translated into Arabic and Bosnian. Um, his latest books include um, Ordogan, the Making of an Autocrat, published by Denver University in 2021, and a much relevant book uh, to our uh, today's event, Nostalgia for uh, the Empire, the Politics of a New Ottomanism. Uh, which was by published uh, Oxford University Press in 2020, which I personally read and found, uh, found it very thoughtful and full of discussion on several historical and contemporary subjects which we seek to bring into our discussion today's um, lecture. Um, I would like to call Dr. Yavuz to share his views and enlighten us about um, how and in what ways contemporary Turkey, and a new Ottomanism intersects and departs from each other into this subject. And what is it as a concept, um, how it is used to expand Turkish foreign policy um, uh, within the Middle East, the Balkans, and as well as in the Caucasus. Dr. Yavuz, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Salam alaikum, Mohammed. Thanks for the King Faisal Center for this opportunity. In this uh, lecture, I want to focus on three issues. First, um, I want to um, uh, provide an archeological uh, picture of the concept of neo-Ottomanism. Sometimes it's also called new Ottomanism. I want to give the intellectual sociological background for the evolution of this concept, and then the impact of uh, how the debate, both the domestic politics and foreign policy of Turkey, somewhat shaped by this debate of neo-Ottomanism or new Ottomanism. To understand uh, neo-Ottomanism, we need to uh, start with the Kemalism. The founding Kemalism is the founding philosophy of the Republic of Turkey. The Ke Kemalism tried to create a new nation state, and it wanted this nation state to be Western, 
secular nation state in that process of uh, creating a secular nation state, Kemalism created an Islamic or a Muslim image of the savage man to depict civilized new Turk, which is supposed to emerge in the future. In other words, for, from the Kemalist perspective, the identity for the Turkish nation is not something to be discovered in the past. It is something to be recreated within the context of the civilizational shift the founding fathers wanted to achieve. In that process, Islam and the Ottoman past became the other. The goal was to dismantle Islamic legacy, Islamic identity, Islamic institutions, Islamic practices to create a new nation state by adapting or mimicking or imitating European development project. That process, uh, this, uh, the founding philosophy of the Republic led by the elite and most of this elite it came from the Balkans, uh, today's Bosnia, Albania, especially from Macedonia. Most of the founding fathers of the Turkish Republic came from uh, Macedonia. That uh, civilizational shift planted the seeds of cultural wars in Turkey. So uh, the contemporary history of Turkey is somewhat a clash between this uh, attempt to create new identity in the future, European secular national identity versus those conservative rural masses, they insisted that the identity is something to be discovered in the Ottoman Islamic practices and tradition. So this is one of the key aspect of this culture war. The second aspect of this culture war, which is uh, Kemalism at the root, two different version of uh, development. Kemalists insisted that Turkey should westernize. The westernization meant for them modernity without Islam. Whereas the conservative masses, they also wanted to modernize, not westernize, but they said modernity with Islam. So this is also the second uh, pillar or axis of this debate, those culture wars in Turkey between the Kemalist versus the Islamist. So uh, this by removing Islam from public life, uh, what happened, uh, the Kemalism in a way, the founding fathers turned Islam into an oppositional identity. Let me indicate what Islam means in Turkey. Islam means different things in different parts of the world. But in the Turkish uh, culture, Islam is, yes, it is a religion, but more than a religion, Islam is a glue and cement of this diverse ethnic groups poured into today's Turkey because of persecution, genocide, and mass killing in the Balkans and Caucasus. So Turkey is in a way nation of nationalities, Albanians, Bosnians, Turbash, Pomak, Cherkes, Chechen, you name it, different, all these Muslims group in the Balkans and Caucasus in the 19th century, they were all running away from the persecution and genocide. They all poured into Turkey, the common glue for this different ethnic group was Islam. In that sense, Islam uh, remains still today the cement of this diverse cement of the Turkish society because of this diverse ethnic groups. The second, Islam in the case of Turkey is a source of legitimacy. It is a source of legitimacy for the state, even for the Kemalist state, even though they wanted to dismantle Islam in the public life, yet Islam was so important because of its aspect of being the glue, they had to establish 
Directorate of Religious Affairs, and the government had to take care of religious educations and the mosque as well, wanted to control the mosque and even create an enlightened Islam, Islam that would facilitate the westernization of the Republic of Turkey. This was, Islam was also there, but fully controlled by the state. The third Islam in Turkey, first, it is a glue, the cement. Second, it is a source of legitimacy. Third, Islam in Turkey is the network of societal life. It is the, the web of daily life, the networking, uh, the trust, uh, uh, cooperation, more or less carried through the Islamic idioms and Islamic practices here, the Sufi orders are very important in Turkey. Nakshibendiya, especially. Second, the Nur movement. These are the two societal Islamic groups. They are Sufi groups. And again, both the Nakshibendis and the Nur Jews are very state-centric uh, uh, groups and very traditional as well. So when the Kemalism tried to remove Islam from the public life, and treat Islam as the enemy or the other, Islam turned into an oppositional identity. And in that process, the Ottoman history was also activated. It was not easy for the counter intellectuals, especially the Sufi intellectuals to discuss Islam openly. So they, discussed Islam, Islamic practices, Islamic identity within the framework of Ottomanism. So Ottoman debate and discussion of Ottomanism became a surrogate identity to discuss Islamism. But again, this Islamism is a Turkish Islamism. It is a, a somewhat, when we have question, we can have that debate, what are the main features of Turkish Islam, but the Ottomanism, the debate of Ottomanism again within that framework, because it was not uh, legally possible, it, would, it could create a big problem if you discuss Islamic identity or Islamism, but the Ottomanism somewhat was a safe domain, and the Ottoman Empire in that process turned into an Islamic empire. Again, the Ottoman history was reconstituted, reimagined in opposition to Kemalism to critique Kemalist identity and Kemalist pattern of modernity. Okay, so the Ottomanism, this debate of Ottomanism, no Ottomanism starts in 1940s in the literature. Ahmed Hamdi Tampanar, a leading novelists, the novels, the poem and art, these were somewhat secure and safe areas to discuss Ottomanism. And within the Ottomanism, you discuss Islam, Islamic norms and Islamic practices as well. To conclude the first part of my lecture, uh, this heavy handed reform, Jacobin secularist, reform project of the founding fathers, in a way not, it didn't only politicize Islam by turning it into an oppositional identity, but it also reactivated the Ottomanism because the Kemalist Republic wanted to forget, forget the past, forget the identity, and now we have to create a new Turk. It's going to be a secular, European nationalist. Whereas the, the counter culture, the conservative masses, they wanted to remember, not to forget. So the more the, more the state uh, suppressed remembering that uh, the forgetting and uh, trying to get rid of the Ottoman and Islamic legacy and tradition, the public the masses, especially the conservative masses and these Sufi networks, they more invested in remembering. And the process was somewhat activated with the new public sphere as the 
Kemalist invested more in education, transportation, modernization, urbanization. The rural people now poured into cities in 1950s and 1960s. And what you see there is that when people came to urban centers, they could not find an ethical code, a moral code to live in the urban centers. Again, Islam and Ottomanism somewhat reconstituted reimagined as a normative order for those urban centers. In other words, the success of Kemalism planted, uh, provided an opportunity for the reimagining of Islam within the framework of Ottomanism. I hope this part is clear so far. Now let me move uh, the second person, which is so crucial, to understand Ottomanism and contemporary Turkish society, that is Turgut Özal. Turgut Özal, uh, he ruled or governed Turkey from 1980 to 1993. Um, Özal, I would say, is the most important uh, politician and statesman after uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. Özal, uh, uh, main orientation, he was a liberal Nakshibandi Muslim. He was a Sufi. His mother was very active in Nakshibandi Sufi orders. And Özal was very liberal. He was trained as economist and lived in the United States. Özal is important because of his neoliberal economic policies. Inward Turkey, economically, politically, culturally, inward Turkey became outward oriented as a result of Özal's neoliberal economic policies. And these neoliberal economic policies of Turkut Özal helped to create a new Anatolian bourgeoisie. This Anatolian bourgeoisie, which emerged in Turkey as a result of Özal's neoliberal economic policies, became the sponsor and architect of this Ottomanism or new Ottomanism or neo-Ottomanism in art, in architecture, in literature, in movies, in fine art, you name it, everywhere. Uh, because Özal neoliberal economic policies created opportunity spaces. First time Turkey had private TV, private radio stations, private universities, private high schools, as a result of Özal's neoliberal economic policies, those new spaces became a site to reimagine Ottoman history and Islam at the same time. In Turkey, Islamism and Ottomanism are sisters. They work together. You cannot separate one from the other because the Ottomanism is somewhat a cosmopolitan, imperial, and it, it, it is somewhat more uh, inclusive. And in that case, the intellectuals, they prefer to talk about no Ottomanism uh, rather than Islamism. So, but again, the Turkish Islamism is somewhat different. So Turkut Özal's uh, period was also this intellectual debate about no Ottomanism was now formulated as a political identity by Turkut Özal. In the end of the Cold War, a major persecution of the Muslims in Bulgaria in 1989, uh, a major deportation exodus of the Muslims from Bulgaria to Turkey, and the Bosnian War in 1993, and the Karabakh conflict in 1991-93. 1991, the Iraq war, which activated the Kurdish question, all these external events forced Turkey to develop a new foreign policy. And Turkut Özal uh, articulated, some intellectuals around Turkut Özal articulated that policy as New Ottomanism or Neo Ottomanism in the pages of Turkey Günlüğü, 
very popular magazine in the 1990s during the Tukutuzal period. They published uh, several special issues. Özal's neo-Ottomanism insisted that Özal also wanted to join the European Union. Again, the Sufi groups in Turkey, Nakhchibandia especially, and the Nurjus as well, they all supported Turkey's full membership in the European Union. The Kemalist secularists, they were hesitant and skeptical of this EU orientation. So there is also this contradiction as well there, that the uh, Islamically oriented Sufis, they all wanted to join the European Union, whereas the secular Kemalists, because of their uh, stress on the sovereignty and nationalism, they were skeptical of EU membership. So Özal insisted he turned uh, Ottomanism as a post-Kemalist, post-national identity. New Ottomanism for Özal was a post-Kemalist identity to connect with the Muslim communities in the Balkans and in the Caucasus. And also for Özal, Ottomanism was a space in between to create a bridge between Kurds and Turk, maybe to treat the Kurds within this imagined Ottoman history as Sunni brothers. So Özal, uh, Özal's neo-Ottomanism was European, cosmopolitan. It insisted on open borders. So this is one version of Ottomanism. Again, it was neo-Ottomanism articulated by Özal at that time. Now let me uh, go and summarize. This is the third part of my lecture. What is neo-Ottomanism? Neo-Ottomanism, it, it is imagining the past. It is identity, post-Kemalist identity. It is an ideology to reimagine state-society relation. Third, it becomes also a policy, what to do, what not to do, especially in regard to foreign policy. So Neo-Ottomanism insists on modernization with tradition. By tradition here, they mean Islam and Ottoman past. And by defining, in, in other words, in the Neo-Ottomanism has a golden age. The golden age is the Ottoman period. For Turkish Islamist or Muslim, the golden age is not necessarily the Asr Sadat of the period of Prophet Muhammad and uh, until the establishment of the Umayyad Empire. But when the Turkish Muslims talk about golden age, they usually refer to classical period of the Ottoman Empire, uh, 14th and 15th century. And for neo-Ottomanists, identity is not something to be created in the future, but rather something we have to discover in our own past. The second neo-Ottomanism means that the Kemalist westernizers versus conservative modernizers. Again, westernizers, the Kemalist modernizers, very much uh, neo-Ottomanist discourse because they insist on vernacular modernity. They say there is no one way of becoming modern. There are multiple ways of becoming modern. There is an Islamic way of being modern as well. So this neo-Ottoman discourse also articulates this difference in the in Turkish intellectual discourse, Kemalist westernizers versus conservative modernizers. In other words, neo-Ottomanism means remembering, not forgetting. It means an attempt to reimagine the past and historicize Turkish identity, to reroot Turkish identity to its religious and the historical, the Ottoman roots as well. 
Uh, let me finally, no Ottomanism more or less is a search for post-Kemalist identity for Turkey to address also some of the issues and conflict around Turkey and the Kurdish question inside the country as well. To conclude, Neo-Ottomanism is not about restoration of the past, but rather coping with the present challenges and conditions. It is dreaming about a better future or making Turkey great again, making Turkey great again, but that is a project for the future, which is inspired by the past greatness. So uh, some of this new Ottomanism or new Ottomanism very much misunderstood outside Turkey. So it is not about the restoration of the empire, but rather it is coping with the present conditions of Turkey. Now let me move to my last part of my lecture, Erdogan. Where, where is Erdogan in this discussion and in this discourse? If you look at the contemporary Turkish history, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk very much with the Kemalism, they created the founding uh, philosophy of Turkish state. Then comes Turgut Özal, his neoliberal economic policies and Sufi orientation help to reimagine what modernity, what society, what state means. He tried to normalize state society relation by reimagining Ottoman legacy. Now Erdogan is very much coming out of uh, non-Sufi Islamic tradition. Erdogan is a product of Imam Hatip schools in Turkey. And those schools in the 1970s and 80s heavily influenced by the books translated from Muslim Brotherhood in, in Turkey, that the books of the Muslim Brotherhood, Sayyid Qutub, Hassan al-Banna, Sayyid Qutub, some other, including the Maududi in Pakistan, all those books were translated into, Turkey, in, into Turkish. So Erdogan is an outcome of this new cultural milieu in which a uh, Muslim Brotherhood text played an important role for his Islam is somewhat different than traditional Turkish Islam because traditional Turkish Islam is very much rooted in Sufi and neo-Sufi networks. Uh, when Erdogan first came to power, he was very much pro-European, but now we find out that his pro-European or the European orientation of his policy from 2002 to 2010 was an attempt to weaken the Kemalist establishment. As he weakened the Kemalist establishment, his true identity very much came out or we can see what he wants to do. For him, Islam, uh, Islam as an Islamist, but he's also nationalist. He's a Turkish Islamist nationalist. He wants, uh, there are four principles of his foreign policy. Let me go to those four principles since we don't have much time. One, Erdogan believes that the problems in the Middle East and around Turkey started with the collapse of Islamic Ottoman Empire. And he sees the Cyprus Pico, the state system in the Middle East, which uh, evolved as a result of World War I as artificial. And he believes that the main problem in the Middle East is this artificiality of the state system. Second, he believes that the Islam is the only effective integrative force is the political Islam. That what is the glue of this uh, countries in the Middle East is Islam. And, and third, he believes that this Islamic integration should be led and guided by Turkey. 
it should be under the Turkish leadership because Turkey had the institution of the caliphate for a long time. And the, finally, Erdogan, he constantly talks about the Palestinian issue. For him, Palestinian issue exposes the weakness of the regional state system and humiliation of the Muslims. And he points out that Palestinian issue is a clear sign when you do not have hegemon in the Middle East. We will be all fragmented and partitioned by outside forces. So these are the four guiding principles of Erdogan's uh, foreign policy, especially toward the Middle East. Again, Erdogan's Ottomanism, unlike Özal's neo-Ottomanism, is an Islamist one, more hegemonic one. It, 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 it seeks to uh, turn Turkey into a, a regional power, yet there is a domestic aspect of his neo-Ottomanism because he wants to also portray himself as an authoritarian sultan of Turkey. And even sometimes he imagined himself as a caliph or people around him wants to uh, perpetuate that image. So this sultanesque image of Erdogan also makes him more comfortable within the Ottoman history, especially when he refers to Fatih Sultan Mehmet and Abdul Hamid II. Erdogan's new Ottomanism is anti-Western, anti-cosmopolitan. It seeks Islamic supremacy under Turkish leadership. And I think this is the why it creates a lot of reaction, both inside Turkey as well. So neo-Ottomanism as a concept also criticized within Turkey and outside. And we will come to those issues maybe when we have questions. And I will finish here, Mohammed. Yes. We can yes. move to the second part. Yes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yapuz, for your remarks, uh, interesting thoughts into um, a very clearly important, but also uh, complicated uh, subject. Um, with that, um, we would like to open the Q&A session. Um, I would like to invite our audience um, to write their questions um, in the Q&A box uh, down the screen. And until uh, we get some question, um, probably as a moderator of this event, I would like to um, ask my own question to Dr. Yavuz, um, and as, as Dr. Yavuz mentioned uh, during his lecture, um, is there any changes on the perception of a new Ottomanism during Ozar time and then in the times of Erdogan? Uh, did, in other words, um, did new Ottomanism change in the perception of Turkish citizen during the times of uh, Ozar in comparison in the times of Erdogan? Well, for Özal, uh, Ottomanism was the only way to understand what is happening in Bosnia-Herzegovina. A genocide was going on in Bosnia against Bosnian Muslims, and European, European Union was very much indifferent. And Özal uh, was very active. He uh, tried to justify Turkish activism not on the basis of Turkish nationalism because Bosnians are not Turks. They are Slavic Muslims. So he said they are our brothers because they are the children of the Ottoman Empire. So there is also this practical aspect why Özal referred to Ottoman Empire. Second, Özal wrote a book called Turkey in Europe, Europe in Turkey. And in that book, he uh, projected and imagined Ottoman Empire as a Balkan Southeast European Empire, not a Middle Eastern Empire, not an Islamic Empire at all. But rather, for him, Ottomanism was a bridge to the Europe. This is how Özal understood 
Ottomanism. Again, his Ottomanism was not Islamist. It was not anti-Western. On the contrary, he wanted to build a bridge and justify Turkish membership in the European Union that you look, our empire was a Southeast European empire. Most of the founding fathers of the Turkish Republic came from the Balkans. And then he tried to justify Turkey's European qualifications in a way. But Özal, uh, membership, his desire to join the European Union, uh, there was a question, he said, we don't want to be a sugar of the coffee, we want to be a cream of the coffee when we join the European Union. He also had this image to change Europe and make Europe more multi-religious as well. Now, Erdogan's Ottomanism is Islamic Ottomanism. It is anti-Western. It tries to build a wall, not a bridge. And uh, Erdogan's Ottomanism uh, is, uh, it seeks regional domination. It's also more toward Middle East. Whereas Özal's Ottomanism, Ottomanist discourse very much aimed toward the Balkans and Europe. I hope I answered your question, Mohammed. Yes, you did uh, indeed. Uh, thank you for that. I would like also to include some of the questions that began to uh, pop up on the screen, uh, of which um, Omar Karim is asking a question What is the role of Turkish nationalism during this debate of a new Ottomanism? What is the place of Turkish nationalism, historically speaking, and also contemporarily speaking? Well, uh, you see, uh, the Turk is a very problematic identity. Who is a Turk? Because the people who came to Anatolia and established Ottoman Empire, their numbers were not more than 10,000. So what happened when these Turkic tribes came from Central Asia, they very much assimilated on their way all the way from Central Asia to today's Turkey with different ethnic groups as well. And uh, as the conversion of Anatolia took place and the Balkans as well, that Islamization meant Turkification. That the Turk for Serbian leadership for many Christians in the Balkans, the Turk is the Muslim, that's it. So to be a Turk, you need to be a Muslim first. If you convert, you cease to be a Turk. So it is easy for Bosnian, Albanian, Turbash, Pomak, Chechen, Cherkas, Arabs to become Turk. The Turk imagined Turkish identity as a thin slice of cheese over the pizza. Underneath, you have onion, mushroom, tomato, you name it, different ethnic groups. So the Turk is this cheese, a thin cheese over the pizza, and the, the dough of the pizza is the Turkish state. This is what the Turk means. So who is, so this is Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the father of the Turk. His mother was Albanian, his dad was Pomak. The person who wrote Turkish National Anthem, Mehmet Akif Ersoy, he was in jail for two years because of his Albanian nationalism. He wrote Turkish National Anthem. So Turkey is a nation of nationalities. And this is why Mustafa Kemal said, Turk is someone who says he or she is a Turk, that's all. Because you cannot, but, the, but the, what is the glue? What is the key for the Turkishness? is Islam and the Ottoman legacy. So these are the two critical aspects of the Turkish identity. So Turkish nationalism, very much, uh, there are several versions of the Turkish nationalism. One is the secular version, the Kemalist one. They imagine Turkish identity without Islam. It did not work. Second is a Turkish identity based on Islamic and Ottoman legacy. I think this is much more common and more shared inside 
Turkey as well. There is a third version of Turkish nationalism. It seeks to draw the definition of Turkishness from Central Asia, from Tashkent, from Uzbekistan, from Kazakhstan. But that kind of Turkism, again, doesn't have much power. So nationalism, neo-Ottomanism, or new Ottomanism is a, a, a very much, it's a form of nationalism. It is an Islamo-Ottoman nationalism, but it also includes Turkish nationalism, but which version of Turkish nationalism is again open to the debate, but the Turk again, a Turk is, is a different type of identity than Kurd, for instance. Kurdish identity is, has a tribal origin, has an ethnicity, has this emphasis on blood. Whereas Turkishness, I am myself. My grandmother, they come from Banya Luka in today's Republic of Srpska or Bosnia-Herzegovina. My father's side come from the Caucasus. So, but I am a Turk. I am as Turk as Mustafa Kemal. I am as Turk as Turgut Özal. When you look at Erdogan, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, his great grandfather is coming from Georgia. He is an Ajar Muslim, Georgian Muslim, but he's a Turk again. So uh, this Turkishness and Islam, Islamic identity, it is so difficult to separate these two. Okay. I hope I answered the question. Yes, uh, you did, of course. And uh, thank you for bringing all the examples into answering this question. Uh, we have also um, a question coming from Unais Madkhali. Um, the question basically asks, um, a moving from uh, historicity of the concept into what most or the majority of Turkish citizen nowadays stand from a new Ottomanism? Is it being populated uh, through the media, through the state organs and publications? Is it being cheered up? Uh, does it have a lot of support in Turkey? It has a lot of support. You can see it in Turkish movies. If you look at the most popular Turkish historical series are the most popular in Turkish TVs, even outside Turkey, especially what I hear in Pakistan and some Asian Muslim communities. And uh, there is this, uh, uh, but this Ottomanism is again imagined one. It is a nostalgic one. It is a nostalgia for the Ottoman Empire. This nostalgia offers an emotional space and refuge where people return during the crisis, especially when Turkey has a number of crises. This greatness, grandeur of the Ottoman Empire becomes very important for the people's imagination of themselves, who they are, and what how they define their state in relation to outside, in relation to other state as well. So uh, no Ottomanism or new Ottomanism is, I would say, uh, there is now evolution of post-Kemalist identity. That post-Kemalist identity, what is evolving still, shaping itself is new Ottomanism or neo-Ottoman identity. It is rooted in the history of the Ottoman Empire and ethical and moral world of Islam. So these, and then the Ottoman Empire reimagined as Islamic empire in Turkey. So what you are seeing in Turkey today is the evolution of post-Kamalist identity in which Islam, a certain aspect of Islam, and, and imagine the constructed Ottoman past plays an important role. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in addition to this question, um, here is a question uh, is coming out from uh, Bruno. Um, as for the new Ottomanism, um, as you were answering how it's being felt by Turkish citizen, how different or similar is it in comparison between 
um, let's say, um, Turks in big cities, including Istanbul, Ankara, and, and Izmir, and um, the, the Eastern Turks um, in the rural areas, let's say, how different or similar they would be uh, viewing the concepts or even the politics of uh, or ideological uh, yes. wings of New Ottoman. Turkey is over 80% urbanized uh, country. And uh, I think there's a uh, distance, cultural distance between Istanbul and rural areas, not as great as used to be, especially with the private TVs, private schools, and emphasis on the transportation. Uh, I think that cultural differences are not that deep yet. In, in uh, Istanbul, in the Izmir, in Western part of Turkey, most of the population there came from the Balkans, from Europe. And Turkey has more Bosnians than Bosnia-Herzegovina today. Turkey has over 4 million Albanians. And um, so for these, uh, we call them Romeli Müslümanları. Romeli means uh, Western Thrace and the Balkans. And um, they tend to be more secular oriented than Anatolian Turks. Or sometimes uh, Özal not Özal, it was Erdogan, actually. He framed this white Turk versus the black Turks. He calls the Kemalist uh, white Turks. They are very much uh, more dominant in Izmir and some part of Istanbul and few other uh, cities than the other image of the black Turks, that they were marginalized, more conservative. But I think that is uh, not true anymore. Uh, Turkey today is somewhat more uh, uh, homogenized in terms of images and cultural discourses as well. The wars in the Balkans and exclusion of Turkey from European Union uh, further activated this desire and debate over a foreign policy aspect of neo-Ottomanism. So Turkey wants to create a new axis uh, in the region by utilizing this Ottoman. Again, the, the Ottomanism has a much positive uh, image in the Balkans among the Muslim communities, not among the Greek Serbs or the Christian communities. But the Ottoman also has negative image in the Middle East. Maybe the situation is a little better in North Africa, but in the uh, Levant, in the Gulf, the image of the Ottoman not very positive. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh, we also have um, some questions related to New, Ottoman, New Ottomanism and Islam. But I prefer before we take these questions, uh, to uh, finish this part, the conceptual part of uh, Ottomanism and Ataturkism. Um, a question comes from Omar al Jadi. He's asking, um, what is the similarity between Ottomanism and Ataturkism? Ataturkism, or what we call Kemalism, or the founding philosophy of Turkish Republic, again, there are major differences. Kemalism wants to create identity in the future. It wants to forget the past. It wants to disestablish Islam from the public sphere. It uh, treats Ottoman past as the other, as a foreign country in a way, or Ottomanism and Islam as sources of the backwardness of Turkey. This is the Kemalist vision and they uh, wanted to create a modern, secular, Islam-free Turk, Islam-free Turk. Whereas New Ottomanism, it wants to discover uh, uh, the identity in the past, in the Ottoman past and in the Islamic past. It wants modernity with Islam, not without Islam. Third, the neo-Ottomanism 
wants to remember what happened, the good and bad days of the Ottoman, especially the persecution of the Muslims in the Balkans, and also the glory of the Ottoman Empire as well. So you have a very different images of identity and development, Kemalism versus the neo-Ottomanism. Uh, thank you. Uh, here is also, um, I would like to take a transitive uh, questions before we go into um, Islam and, and a new Ottomanism. Here is Khalid Al-Yami asked the question, is the idea of a new Ottomanism an expansionist uh, in itself? I don't, I don't see it as expansion. As I said, the neo-Ottomanism or new Ottomanism is about domestic issues, problems, and culture wars of Turkey. It has, uh, Turkut Özal wanted to help the Bosnian Muslims. It wasn't expansionist policy. It wanted to help these communities because they were confronting and facing a genocide. And Özal also wanted to help the, in the Caucasus, the Karabakh issue, but Turkey couldn't do much. So I don't, I don't take as a concept, no Ottomanism is more about the present conditions of Turkey. It is not an expansionist. Uh, it, it, it is unfortunately Ahmed Dautolo and Erdogan, some of their policies and discourses in Libya, in Syria, uh, and then also Erdogan's uh, assumption of the Middle East state system as artificial, uh, one might think those as expansionist some way, but I think um, if you look at the concept itself, how it evolved, it is more about the domestic issues and domestic politics of Turkey than the foreign affairs of Turkey. I would say. So uh, I would not see new Ottomanism or now Ottomanism as expansionist yet. In the hand of Erdogan, one might say, yes, there are some signs. But um, I think no Ottomanism cannot be confined to Erdogan's policies. That's all I can say. Yes, thank you. Um, we'll move now into some questions related to new Ottomanism and Islam. A question from Mohammed Steri is asking how new, new Ottomanism shapes or intersects with um, Turkish state's pan-Islamic outreach. Uh, look, um, now um, there is something called Turkish Islam. Turkish Islam is very different than Muslim Brotherhood type of Islam. Turkish Islam is state-centric. State in the Turkish Islam is above the religion. Kanun in the Ottoman Empire, who had the Kanun, was one step ahead than Sharia. Second, Turkish Islam is Islam without Sharia today in contemporary Turkey, even for Erdogan. In the Turkey, that the Islam is imagined as an ethical, moral, and a glue, a moral system, and it is also a glue. It is not about Sharia. Whereas Muslim Brotherhood, they want Sharia state. They want Islamic state. They want Sharia state. And this is not what Turkish Islam is all about. Third, Turkish Islam is more Sufi-oriented. And Muslim Brotherhood, they don't like Sufis, you all know. They are more ideal. For them, there is an Islamism a political project. For Turkish Islamic discourse, including for Erdogan, I would say, there is no debate about Sharia. It is a more ethical and moral system. Still, Turkish state is the sacred entity one step above Sharia and religion, that the religion has to serve for the state, not other way around. This is the Turkish cognitive map 
how it works when it comes to state and religion. So um, yet the Turks consider themselves as Muslim and they believe that they have moral responsibility to help Muslim communities in the Balkans and Caucasus especially, and also support the Islamic causes in the different parts of the world. So uh, you cannot separate Turkish identity from Islam, but what kind of Islam, what the function of Islam in Turkish identity and in Turkish mentality is somewhat, I would say, different than some other Islams, how it is vernacularized in each culture, because Islam is a universal religion, but it vernacularized, particularized in different ways in Indonesia, Malaysia, Turkey, and uh, Kuwait or some other Arab countries. Yes. yes. I hope and I answered the question. Yes, yes, but of course. Erdogan supports the Muslim Brotherhood today. Turkey is the hub of Muslim Brotherhood because uh, Erdogan feels that the Muslim Brotherhood would is the major societal force in different Arab countries and feels that they are uh, looking for his leadership, leadership of Turkey and leadership of Erdogan to unify and create a political ummah or some kind of unity. But again, uh, but the vision of Erdogan is very different than I would say the vision of a Muslim Brotherhood because they are very much a Sharia oriented. They want Islamic State. Whereas the situation in Turkey is different. Again, there's another factor you have to take into account that the Islamic debate in contemporary Turkey is very much shaped by the economic needs of the country. Turkey is not oil rich country. Turkey is not a rentier state. This is a tax based economy. So everyone has to pay close attention to economic well-being of the country. So the Islam has to facilitate that economic prosperity or economic development of the country as well. Yes, indeed. And also um, an additional question from Masideri concerning um, the exportation of uh, type of Islam. As we see uh, now, there is um, um, a kind of highlighting and increasing of exportation of uh, matur maturidism and also Naqshbandiya connection with Central Asian states. Is there any hand of Turkey in that? Yes, there is. Uh, Turkey in the Ottoman Empire always considered itself as a Sunni, Hanafi, and Maturidi. Again, Sunni, Hanafi, and Maturidi. And um, uh, but uh, again, Islam in the Ottoman Empire, even in Turkish Republic today, it has to serve for the state, not other way around. So the Maturidi uh, is very much, uh, he himself is from uh, today's Uzbekistan, uh, uh, is a, a different uh, understanding of Hanafi, Islam, especially the role of Akal versus uh, Wahi in the Maturidi Islam. Taliban is a Maturidi as well today. They are also very much into Maturidi Islam. So, but there are different versions of Maturidism. Turkish Directorate of the Religious Affairs uh, uh, very much um, promote and advocate Maturidi version of Islam. I don't know how your listener, who knows uh, Maturidi Islam, maybe uh, some scholars might, but most of the Muslims, uh, I don't know whether they know what these differences of uh, Maturidism, but the Naqshbandiya is uh, certainly a, a major Sufi order, 
most of the Naqshbandi sheikhs were Kurds. And e even today, many Sufi, Naqshbandi Sufi leaders are Kurd. And so these Naqshband orders are also very state-centric, state-oriented as well. But yes, Turkey, the Directorate of Religious Affairs, uh, the ANET, what we call, is very active in Europe, in Central Asia and Balkans to protect and promote maturity version of Islam. Yes, indeed. Uh, moving from um, New Ottomanism and Islam, um, a question here concerning the regional competition of ideologies in the Middle East. Uh, Fahad al Khaldi is asking a question Is there any competition between the new Ottomanism and Wilayat al Faqih um, as coming from Iran uh, into the Middle East? What's your views on this? Wilayat Faqih. I think these are very different issues, uh, Wilayat Faqih, because in Turkey, again, Islam in Turkey is uh, a Sharia free Islam that it's an ethical system, it is a glue. It is the tin cheese on the top of the pizza. Whereas in the case of Iran, uh, their uh, political experience under Shah, Musaddiq, all those experiences, and then the Khomeini's construction of Wilayat al Fakir is uh, very different there you have a spiritual leader who is somewhat infallible. And uh, the Khamenei. Khamenei happens to be a Turk as well. You know, he's not a Persian. The Iranian uh, supreme leader is an Azeri Turk. And he speaks some of his writings are also in Turkish as well. So all the Shiism which is the product of Safavid empire, it is more or less codified by the Turkic tribes came from Central Asia, the Safavid empire under the Shah Ismail in 16th century. Uh, but the Ottomans um, emphasize the Sunni Islam in opposition to Safavid, Safavid state because there was a rivalry and uh, still a major country Turkey sees as a rival in the Middle East is Iran. That tradition still plays a role, but I don't see any uh, similarity between the two. Because there is no debate over Sharia, there is no debate about uh, return of the hidden Imam, you know, those are very different cosmology, different history, different theology in Iran than the Turkish story. Now, Ottomanism is not a theological discussion. It is a political. Uh, it is a response to a crisis of Turkey. Whereas Wilayat al it has a more theological, religious debate and discussion within the Shia Islam, what you need to do until the return of the hidden Imam. If it doesn't come, what we can do? So you, then the Imam Khomeini created this Balayat uh, al the Supreme Leader, to address some of those issues. But the situation in Turkey is different. But one thing is important. Uh, let me move to a more political uh, aspect. Uh, that if you look at the Middle East today, uh, and Turkey and Iran are two states, they compete over regional hegemony. There is that competition, but there are also sometimes cooperation as well between the two countries at the same time. Yes, that's very, all I can say. Very interesting indeed, and thank you. Uh, an extension of the regional competition, uh, moving from Iran uh, into, uh, uh, let's say, Arab nationalism. Uh, is there any uh, real competition or is New Ottomanism or Ordoganist New Ottomanism um, appearing in a direction against um, Arab states, um, Arab uh, National League? Well, uh, I think Erdogan's New Ottomanism is in, in uh, 
it could be reconciled with Arab nationalism, Arab nationalism. But it is in contradiction, it is in opposition to nation state system in the Arab world. That uh, he claims that the Sykes Pico or post Ottoman Middle East state structure is artificial and it creates all kinds of problems in the region. And the Arabs should unify the only glue which unify the Arabs together as Saman is Islam and Erdogan thinks that they should unify, but he prefers that unification to take place under Turkey's leadership. So th there is, yes, there, there are some aspects, yes, that Arab nationalism is, uh, no Ottomanism would support Arab nationalism if Arabs, they come together, one entity around the shared language of Arabic and religion, Islam, yet they want also, it would be better, they say, if it is carried out, it happens under the leadership of Turkey. If it is not, still, they would prefer unification of the Arab countries because from Erdogan's perspective, um, the, the state system in the Middle East is artificial. This is also more or less the perspective of some of the scholars who work on neo-Ottomanism as well. Yes, uh, also um, there is a question before the last um, coming from um, Omar Karim. Um, considering the economic hardship that uh, domestic Turkey has been going through in the past few months um, and also years, especially since the coup attempt in uh, 2016, how new Ottomanism as a cheered up concept is being um, continuing in the, uh, let's say, bad economy of Turkey? When, when the economy of the country um, goes down, would there be still any support for a new Ottomanism? Yes, there will be. Again, you have to separate different versions of Ottomanism. Ottomanism, new Ottomanism, new Ottomanism is about domestic issue and domestic crisis of Turkey. And uh, the bad economy, people uh, do not, from Turkish perspective, they don't see Erdogan as Ottomanist, but they see him as Islamist, uh, seek to imitate some aspect of Muslim brotherhood. So how the majority of the Turks see Erdogan is not as the champion of neo-Ottomanism, but rather uh, as someone who cares only his own political survival, and he imitates and uses Muslim Brotherhood. In that sense, these are in the Turkish context. It is very different than how you see neo-Ottomanism as if it is represented and promoted by Erdogan. That's not the case. Uh, Turkish economy is in major crisis today. And, uh, but this crisis um, is something different than this cultural discourses and the debate. Certainly because of the economic crisis, Erdogan's power base is much weak today, but uh, I, I, from my own understanding, his days are numbered. I think Erdogan is less likely to win uh, the elect next election, but that doesn't mean the end of no Ottomanism, no. It might mean a refresh, the reading of no Ottomanism, because this is post Kemalist identity that we have. So it is not championed and supported by Erdogan. Erdogan's current policies, especially after the Arab Spring, his policies since 2011 is much more destructive. Many people are very critical of his policies in Turkey. And uh, 
So I, I, I don't equate Erdogan to Turkey. Turkey is much bigger, more sophisticated country than Erdogan. He's ruler now, but I think his days are numbered. But he has, unfortunately, a very bad legacy that Turkey has to work and uh, improve, uh, to, especially in foreign policy. Turkey has bad relations with Egypt, with Syria, uh, including some of the Gulf countries. Uh, Turkey doesn't have any friend in the Middle East today except Qatar, but Qatar is not a regional power. And uh, also Turkey's relation with Iran is an uh, enduring rivalry. Turkey and Iran are always in competition in the Caucasus. Look now in the Caucasus or the Karabakh war, Iran, the Shia Islamist Iran is Armenian Christians. Whereas Sunni Turkey is on the side of the Shia Azerbaijanis. So um, uh, there is a major co competition and there were a series of military maneuvers on the borders of Azerbaijan that Turkish military participated. So um, Turkey's unfortunately uh, foreign policy is uh, under major uh, confusion and chaos, I would argue, that um, I don't know uh, how will the new government deal with it, but I think uh, there is a room for improvement, reorientation of the foreign policy, because everyone inside the country as well, the opposition parties are all critical of uh, Erdogan and his foreign policy towards Syria, toward other countries in the region. And uh, many people don't want to see Istanbul to become hub of Muslim brotherhood. Uh, that's also another aspect. So I think uh, things will change when Erdogan goes away, but not neo-Ottomanism or new Ottomanism. Yes, before we reach uh, the last question, uh, which came um, actually from an anonymous attendee, is asking what is the future of the new Ottomanism? And I guess this is a, a very good question to end uh, the lecture with. In addition to a question by Thari Al-Dandan, who's asking um, what do you recommend of books to read about the subject? So here is one about the future of new Ottomanism and what books would you be able to recommend for our audience? Thank you. Well, um, I think uh, new Turkey, the new generation, new Turkey is not confined to borders of Turkey. That are close to five to six million Turks in different European countries. Some are in the European Parliament. Some are in European uh, successful business people in different European countries. Some are professors, scholars, journalists. So you cannot, uh, Turkey is not in Europe, but the Europe is very much in Turkey. And there is this close connections, human to human connection networks. If you look at the Turkish airline, it flies constantly to different German cities and towns. So, um, developments in Europe is going to have a major impact on Turkey. Turkey always, it's Qibla, Qibla. Religious Qibla is Kabe, yes. But the political and cultural Qibla of Turkey always remained Europe since the Tanzimat reform in 1839. And with the Turkish uh, European candidacy that the European Union agreed in 1999 Helsinki uh, meeting, Turkey and majority of the Turks, over 65%, even today, they want to join the European Union. So the glue of Turkish societies is Islam. And the economic, political, cultural Qibla of Turkey is European Union. So 
I think this desire, this yearning to join the European Union will shape Turkey's future policies. This is how I see. And Turkey is also going to become much more important uh, country in the Caucasus as well. So the Balkans and the Caucasus, including the developments in Russia, which will have a direct impact on Turkey because of large Russian Muslim communities in Turkey, what goes on in the North Caucasus will have a great impact and Turkey will get more involved in those areas as well. So I think um, the Turkey cannot be imagined as a nation state. Turkey is somewhat bigger than Turkey itself because of these networks and connections in the Caucasus, in the Balkans, in the Europe, And I think uh, the Middle East is going to become less relevant for Turkish foreign policy in the future. I think the new government in Turkey will distance itself from the Middle East, that's my own reading, to focus more to Europe and the Balkans and toward Russia because of the trade between Russia and Turkey is now uh, growing, but the Europe constitutes 60% of Turkish export that Turkey sells good to different European countries. I think the economic factors are going to guide and shape the future foreign policy of Turkey, including tensions and ethnic conflict in the Caucasus and in the Balkans as well. I think Turkey will only engage with the Middle East in relation to Kurdish question. Turkey will, uh, Turkish foreign policy toward Iraq and Syria will be determined by the Kurdish issue and Turkey doesn't want to see a independent Kurdish state. Turkey wants to see territorial integrity of Iraq and Syria to be preserved. I think this is the only red line that the Turkey will get involved in the Middle East. And I don't see the relation with Qatar as a permanent. I think it was a temporary arrangement because of the crisis in the Gulf. But uh, I, I, I do think that Turkey will move away from these um, some of the mistakes in other it made. Uh, and uh, I, I, I don't uh, see a expansionist Turkey in the future. I think Turkish economy, Turkish public, Turkey's engagement with Europe constrain and limit what Turkey can or cannot do. And I will finish here. And for what to read about the neo-Ottomanism, the first and foremost, you have to read my book. It is... Uh, Uh, came out last year by Oxford University Press, Nostalgia for the Empire, the Politics of Neo-Ottomanism. And then the second, if you want to see how Erdogan is not, uh, his policy and his vision, I have a book just came out uh, three months ago. It is called Erdogan, the... uh, the Making of an Autocrat. Uh, it is published by Edinburgh University Press. And um, I, I think those are the, my book is the only book on neo-Ottomanism. There is no single, uh, another book deals with this topic. So, um, but if you want to do more reading about Turkish society, I would suggest you to read the books of Nulufer Göla, sociologist in France, or uh, some of the books he died, Sheriff Mardin, a leading Turkish sociologist. Uh, he wrote a number of books. If you want to know more about the Ottoman Empire, look at the books of Halil Inalcık. 
He was a professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, he wrote. What's his name? Hilal Inatçu. Halil, 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 Halil Inatçu. Uh, his books are the best about the Ottoman Empire, and that's all. Uh, yes. Yes. Well, many thanks. My bibliography of my books have might help those who want to read more. Yes. Yes, indeed. Um, many thanks, uh, Dr. Niafuz, uh, for your participation. Uh, we uh, reached the end of a Q&A session. Before I conclude, do you still have any final thoughts or uh, comments? I, I don't, but I would like uh, our listener in uh, different parts of the world to really uh, rethink this whole concept of new Ottomanism, uh, not a policy of foreign affairs, but rather an outcome of a deep crisis in Turkey. That's all I can say. And I think, uh, yes, I will end here. Thank you, Mohammed. Thanks for your center. Thanks for Mohammed Sudairi as well, for both of you organizing this and for this great opportunity. And I hope to see you soon. Of course, and thank you uh, as well for your participation and the presentation of very interesting and thoughtful um, ideas. With that and the, the limited time we have, I would like to um, thank Dr. Yafuz for his participation and the presentation of his thoughts, uh, which enlightened our minds about the subject. I wish we can clap for you, um, Dr. Yafuz. But probably next time when we have offline events here in Riyadh, inshallah, inshallah. Uh, for information um, about the work and the projects of the Asian Studies Units or uh, other research units and the center, uh, you may visit um, the website of um, kevkris.com. Uh, you may also subscribe to the center uh, email newsletter to be updated about um, the future events and publication until uh, we see you um, all in other events organized by the King Christ Center for Research and Islamic Studies. Thank you um, once again um, for joining us and I wish you uh, a very good day to you all.